What's up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats. On this episode, we chat with the director and the owner of Butcher Box Cycling, Steve Cullen. I met Steve Cullen in Charlotte, North Carolina about four or five years ago where he pitched me the idea of Faster Days and to see it kind of unfold into a team has been something really cool and inspiring to see. Also, this episode is brought to you by Orange Mud. Orange Mud is a hydration pack company which offers all your needs for any adventure that you're gonna go on, whether that's running or cycling. So be sure to check them out at orangemud.com. Yeah. All right, guys, <laughs> welcome back to Coffee and Band Chats. I have just straight talked to Steve for 20 minutes without being on record. And let me tell you, it was about as motivational as it gets. And I'm now going to have to put him back on blast because I think he's pretty much telling us where Faster Days even came from and why this guy is who this guy is. I mean, he literally has probably raced every crit in America. I mean, yeah, hands down, pretty like clear. local local to national level, whatever. So you name yeah. it, Steve, let's hear it, man. Hey, what's going on? I'm so happy to, to be on the program with you. And uh, it's, uh, I'm pretending we're in your van while we're doing this, we're which is creepy. Van, yeah, yeah it's, cre it's creepy and awesome in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a little, it's a little snug, but uh, yeah, it's been great catching up with you, uh, you know, the last 20 minutes without recording yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think uh, as soon as I heard that you were doing, as soon as I heard that you were doing a project where you're kind of diving into some of the personalities of the sport, and uh, you've put together an amazing roster of people during your career that you that you have access to, all the way from Chloe and Justin and some icons in the sport. And so, uh, thanks so much for having me on. It's a it's an honor and a privilege to be part of that that group of people. I really appreciate it. No, yeah, dude, and and like it's an honor to be chatting with you because I mean, like literally, you've taken a team from nothing. I think it was just you and another dude, essentially. <laughs> a few other just, dudes. <laughs> a few other dudes, a few other guys, a few other local guys. Cause like, I mean, it goes all the way back to like monster media. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I remember you gave me your like business card at Novant. People probably don't even know what Novant is. Yeah. You know, right. Novant right. Health criterion. No, it's going, it's gone. Yeah. And I got a business card from you and you told me, you were like, I'm going to create a documentary about <laughs> American crit racing and I'm going to do all these crit races. And I was just like, this dude is nuts. It's nuts, but it's pretty fucking cool. So, so yeah, tell me, tell me where Faster yeah. Days even stems from. Like what? Yeah, it was, a, it's kind of, uh, I know it's funny. It's so funny that there's only so many people. There's like a, there's like a set of people in the crit nation that know about Faster Days. And then there's a whole other set that that was like an ancient, it's an ancient code now. <laughs> it's yeah, this, yeah. Uh, you know, the thing was, is I think, I think like a lot of people that get into sport, I, you know, I was looking for, I was, you know, at this time, I was, I was pretty old at that time, right? I don't know what it was, like maybe 34 years old or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was a while ago. So, so I had kind of gotten this thing. I'd been an athlete my whole life and, uh, and then really focused on my career for a bit and then wanted to get back into sports. And bikes, bikes have always been part of it. And so it was a natural place for me to dive back in. And uh, when I looked around and saw crit racing, I just, the sport about 10 years ago was really starting to explode, if you remember. Oh, yeah. UHC was just starting to become a thing. And I think American, it was the post Lance, it was the post Lance era. And so I think a lot of human beings were like, okay, I'm sick of talking about how fucking shitty Americans are with bikes. Like, you know, I think, I think Americans were just like, okay, one fucking guy, could you not just burn all of us at the stake because of that fucking one dude? Yeah. And so he was this amazing. So I think America was like, you know what? Fuck Lance and fuck all the Tour de France shit, and like, fuck Europe. If Europe doesn't want us, I don't want Europe, so fuck you. And said, that shit going on right next door is pretty cool. And then, so what happened is the American crit scene really started to take off, right? Sure. Now, crits were always part of it, where people were racing in parking lots and around their notebook and stuff, but all of a sudden, prize money crits started to come back up, and I think the culture started to explode. So this, this like overlap from where I decided to hop back into the sport from my youth, and and pick it back up again i i was the the golden moment when i got back in which you probably don't know is like when i got back in i was 220 something pounds right yeah i was 220 something pounds i had tits i had dude tits right I, and i remember sitting on the edge of my bed one day and my stomach was so big i couldn't see my dick 
And, <laughs> and I said, and I was like, what the fuck happened to me? Like, I was like an all American athlete. Like what yeah. the fuck happened? So like, now I just can like, barely I see when you pee. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You can only imagine. You need a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> like trying to figure that shit out. If someone, I hope you're recording this on video because. Oh yeah, this is all on video, man. Oh, the gesture you just made was epic. That was. You like, you like virtually lifted my fake stomach and then something with something down there. So, so, there, so anyway, so I had this big moment and I was like, okay, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go, go back into bikes and change my life in this whole bit. And it was that. So that personal motivation. That's very, I think everybody can understand is like, I just like, what the fuck happened to me physically? And I felt bad about myself. And then I dove back in and two years later, I started to like race bikes and got a whole new bike license and everything. Like I started from scratch. I like, I was like, the old me is dead. I don't even care who I was in my twenties. I started as a fucking cat five all over again from the beginning. Right. And like out there in like my XXL kit. You know what I mean? Like, oh, dude, I know what you mean because I met you in like a three XLL kit. You know? like, <laughs> there was like extra L's, and I didn't understand it. I knew that there was more X's, but they added L's to this jersey. <laughs> right, right. Fit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's like club fit, race fit, club fit, and then there is like whatever, Batman like fit. yeah, right, <laughs> right, right, Weight Watchers division. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's what, so I dove in and instantaneously got swept up in it. And here's what happened is I Googled this thing and I was like, oh, I wonder what the history of this is. And I Googled history of American crits and it came back fucking zero. And I'm, what the fuck is that? Yeah. So within three months from that very day, I had quit my job, uh, like sold off shares of my fucking company the whole bit and then got, um, and then got in the van, got into like a fucking Jayco with my wife at with my wife and we just like went across the country uh girlfriend my girlfriend at the time and uh and we just like head off across the country and i said i put together this calendar and i just started this research process where i started to call up everybody that i fucking knew even people i didn't know and started asking them what the coolest crits on the country were and then put together this calendar of like about 55 to 60 races and then vowed to hit every local thing and i raced something like 79 crits in that that one year right wow. so to, so to, so from cat five to cat from cat five to cat two was like two years where i just raced 60 days a year plus on the track so i was racing like 100 races a year for like two years and then finally it was like okay now i can do all the big races and then and then and then i had that big revelation where it was like oh my god like uh like there's this no history and then i quit and then just went and did it and then i did all of them and since that point i think there's a few that i haven't gotten to but yeah, I mean, I, I have like, I have like over 400 race numbers on my wall, you know what I mean? And so it's like, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And like, I make a point of going when I went to all these races is I made a point of going there and like, I meet the race director and I ask them who did the thing. And then I go to the local bike shop with the dude and then I meet the person and then I go do the local group ride. And like at the group ride, meet the dude that did the thing before the other stuff. And like, it's all right there. It's a lot like surfing. Like you got to go, you learn the break, you learn who's at the break, you learn the best times, you learn the legends of it, and you learn who the OG is, and the best board shaper. And then all of a sudden this fucking Kung Fu culture started to happen. And about, I think about two years, I think about a, a year after that, you know, I did a short podcast for about, you know, I did about 25 episodes uh, on that, just all the personalities. And, and then, and then I realized I kind of wanted to do something else with it and started up a, a team to continue racing this stuff because I was like, there's no pipeline where people are really focused directly on crits as a team at the time. And so I started to start it up with a, a couple of friends of mine from a group ride that we were basically on. We would beat the shit out of each other on a group ride. And then we said, why don't we just start a team and go do this thing? Um, and so that was the goal was always to like, just show people this amazing world behind the curtain that exists. It's just, just like surfing, skating, skiing. I mean, all these like, fringe sports right like if you don't have a stick and ball sport it's like oh there's like if you're a stadium sport then there's like hallowed ground stadiums but there's only like one pathway to get to those things is like you got to be on the Yan you know, the yankees or whatever right yeah, yeah. but for outdoor sports <clears throat> for outdoor sports outside is for everybody so like there's there you know in mountaineerings there's the k2s and the everests and the whatevers and the, the, the dawn walls and all this shit right there's all these fucking locations and then yeah. surfing has got, you know, whatever, Mavericks. It's got all these famous breaks. 
So the outside world is way more accessible and also way more uncharted, right? Like you have to sure. figure out where these things are and where they are. And bikes are an outdoor sport primarily. I mean, there's indoor versions, but primarily the genres of bikes are outdoors. And so it follows the kind of the same rules is that they're unique courses and unique pockets of the world with unique histories. And America has more of these than anything. Whereas Europe has got, what, what Europe has in climbs, the U.S. has in crits, right? There's yeah. like famous, famous climbs that you fucking fly to and go and do these things. And they're amazing. Angleroo, Mont Ventoux, blah, 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 right? They're great. No one's saying they're not yeah. fucking great. In the U.S., we have these crits. And it's like, and everybody can fucking do them. There's a citizen's race. There's a cat five. Everybody can do these things. And then there's also a pro race, which only less than 1% of people with a racing license can do, you know? Yeah. And, and Pro level, a pro level crit in the U.S. is a magical, exciting, thrilling, life changing thing, and it's like becoming a black belt at something. It takes a long time to get there. Even if you're a super gifted genetic freak, the skills of crit racing are very, very unique, very difficult to learn. And then once you kind of figure it out, um, you have access into this amazing history. And there's a lot of it, and it's still thriving. And just like everything, just like famous hiking trails or restaurants or whatever their their time comes and goes and some of them last forever like somerville in redmond derby days and this other stuff and then some of them have a heyday of 10 or 15 years and then they go away and i don't really cry about that that's just the transformation that restaurant was amazing for a while that band was awesome you know like yeah, yeah. like rage against the no, machine yeah, was amazing it's yeah it's okay that they don't tour anymore it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like that was the thing. So, so I think, you know, faster days was a way for me to, to codify and say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to tell the story of these, tell the stories of these crits. I'm going to write articles and stories about it. I'm going to do interviews with the people that are racing it. And I'm going to share the skills that it takes to thrive at it. So people can learn. And then it's kind of transformed from just reporting on it to saying, well, I want to go do this in a more detailed way and start to build a team of some sort that specializes this and takes people from not knowing anything about it to like the top of that genre. And, and so it's kind of evolved over time where it's, there's a media portion to it, which I may or may not pick up someday. And then there's the performance portion to it, which is where uh, the current team goes, goes to right now. So I think, you know, it's, it's an entrepreneurial endeavor, but I, I think it's, you know, it's been very much about the love, uh, I view it as a very patriotic endeavor. Like, you know, I love the U.S. I love its cities. I love its people. I love its countryside. And I love its sports. And I consider running, you know, I think consider faster days an extremely, from in a, in a weird way for many people. But I think it's like a very patriotic thing for me, you know, is, is faster days. No, for sure. I mean, and, and like, yeah, when I first met you, you were just as passionate then as you are now, if not more, you know. And so, like, yeah. it's su it was super cool to kind of see that kind of fold um and come and like become and blossom um but yeah man so like with butcher box now you know mm. you're not you're not really racing it was almost like overnight i felt like like one day i saw you at a crate you were racing you were full gas like podium whatever <laughs> and then you have headphones and you're running around like a chicken <laughs> with your head cut off holding papers that needed to be signed because some athlete wasn't signing it so like where did that switch happen, man? Yeah. Well, I think it's like, yeah, it's funny. Um, well, I think there was a bit of it is um, we were kind of talking before, you know, before we hopped on today, we we're kind of talking where, you know, human beings, you know, you come to these transition moments in life, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think if you're doing it right, if you're doing it right, you, you, you hit those transition moments head on. I think if you're doing it poorly, those things consume and eat you and you become a horrible person, yeah, you know, yeah, sure. but I think. You know, but I think you should be having a midlife crisis every three or four years. You know what I mean? Like oh, you yeah. should be really, you, you should be, you should be going hard at something and then it should be raising questions about who you are and what you're doing. And I think if you live a superficial life, the water on the surface is always clear. But I think if you go deep enough, it gets pretty dark and muddy down there and you never know what you're going to find. Right. For so, sure. so I think. You know, I think in life, I think it's the same way as, I, you know, I'm not very excited about floating around in the dinghy on the surface. I always have my eye on what's down in the bottom portions. And I think with, with sports, I went pretty far out there. And like, yeah, I, you know, I wasn't the best bike racer, but, you know, like I, I had pretty good results at a national level. I could win locally. And, and that was satisfying to me. And it was cool for a time period to always be the fastest guy in a group ride. That was cool enough for me, right? You know, at 40 yeah, years yeah. old, that was like cool. And I was like, okay, I felt what that was like. It was great. I had the respect to my peers. 
um, I did a lot of things wrong, a lot of things right and all that. And I felt like, okay, I got what I was going to get out of that. How much harder would I go? Every athlete faces this. How much more am I willing to give for how much microscopic gain? And I was like, okay, you know, like a top 10 in a national level crit is, is probably about where I'm going to max out. I mean, like how much am I, am I really going to ever podium against Dan Holloway? It's like, I was like, okay, that reward isn't there. But I think, I think, what I've learned is I really fucking know bike races and I know bike racing and I can walk up to almost any bike race in the country and predict the podium pretty accurately, like nine out of 10 times. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, you know, I really know bike racing. I really know the scene. I really know traveling. And also at my age, I'm 45 years old. Like I have at least a decent amount of like life management skills under my belt. I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there's parts of me that are a disaster, but you know, so yeah, yeah. I was like, this is, I'm at a good point in my life where I can really relate to other people. I can really relate to other people on that path and help show them that path. And I think I'm still a lifetime, you know, I'm still a lifetime competitor. And I think, you know, what my life's journey is to become a master competitor. I want to be like a master competitor sure. and at, at all things, whether it's business or graphic design or sports or whatever, the pursuit of mastery of competition is what it's a, is, is, a, is a driving force. For me. And so I think it was easy for me to say, okay, I can continue to pursue my life's work of becoming a master competitor. And I can do that in a different way and pass on these other skills to other people and then learn from them and be around them and, and experience that culture in a very rewarding way and still compete and fight and do all that other stuff. And like when we race, when our team races, I'm fucking racing motherfuckers. Like I am sure. fucking, racing like i'm there to fucking give our best i won't say win i'm not going to say win. you can't control winning you know you can't control winning what you can control is competing and like i'm there to give 100 percent of our collective best effort and you know in the team what we say what we say at butcher boxes is out ready out think out fight right and so that's my job is to make sure that we go through all three of those phases every single time, right? Are, have we out ready? Do we know the course, the competition, the history, where we're at? Are we out ready? Are the bikes perfect? Are we traveling flawlessly? Are we eating well? Are we sleeping well? Are we showing up on time? Is the vibe chill or tense or whatever it needs to be? Sometimes the vibe needs to be fucking ballistic and sometimes the vibe needs to be fucking mellow, whatever it is. And then the fight portion, have I done everything possible to allow my athletes to be the most tenacious motherfuckers on the course that day? Yeah. So that we know no matter what ends up happening on that day, that there is, we, we took charge of everything we could control and, and we got beat. But my job is to make sure that we never lose, right? We can get beat, yeah. but we can't lose, right? And so if we give everything, the only times I've ever been frustrated with myself or with my team is like when we just like race like fucking boners, right? Like whatever it is. And it's like, we're so much better than that. What the fuck happened? And when my team's when my teams don't do their absolute best, I hold myself personally accountable. It's like my job to make sure that with whatever our resources are in time, that when they're out there on the course, they are fucking switched on and they're the best competitors in the field. They're making the best decisions faster than everybody else, regardless of whatever fucking legs they're on. And so that, that quest to, to be a, a master competitor is, is what drives me to stay in the sport. And I have a huge passion for it. I, I don't think that's ever going to change. I hope it doesn't change. I mean, the day the fire goes out, just fucking bury me, right? I mean, yeah, no, for you know? sure. And, you know, and I, I, think, I think that was pretty interesting what you said a little earlier about, like, you know, you could show up to a crit and you could, you could predict the podium. And so that kind of, like, segues me into, you know, John Harris, man. I mean, like, one of your athletes, podiums at Athens. Like, yeah. what was your thoughts going into Athens? You know, you have a team. I mean, it's the biggest crit of the year yeah that's great yeah i mean it's insane especially on the southeast everybody's fit you know speed week everybody's racing into their legs like yeah. what like could you have predicted that like could you have seen well, that I did. yeah we did we did predict yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah well we figured we were gonna have um there's a few things in there that i mean blah 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 but but i think i think there's a level of saying that it's going to something something's going to that those races super crits transform athletes right and there's only a certain set of athletes that can really do well in super crits because uh, the physiology behind them you know everybody knows once you get past that 2000 kj barrier that there's you know a whole new set of 
athlete starts to excel at that point, sure. right? And so, so we have uh, on our team, we had um, three guys that were physically capable of performing on that, right? Um, that, that I really felt were physically capable at the top level on that. I think, you know, one of them was, one of them was a little too young to really know how to close the deal on that. They would have had yeah. way too many choices to make. And I had two guys going into that that we knew um, were definitely capable of closing, closing the deal on it. My predictions on that day, because uh, Texas Roadhouse, we knew that the Dans were going to be out of control, like out of fucking control. Yeah. And we were like, they're on form. They're only showing up to a handful of crits. And, you know, we all know that the Dans, when the Dans are feeling both pressured and fitness, that they only do one thing. Like they both only do one thing. And they just try to like fucking sucker punch the field. And, and we knew Dan was going to try to sucker punch the field or someone was, right? So yeah. we knew it was going to be super, super hard. We also knew that EDA was going to have a bunch of South American horsepower that they just brought up from somewhere, yeah, which yeah. is a factor every single speed week. And for some yeah. reason, every time, everybody's like, who the fuck are these guys? Does it matter? It's the same group of fucking guys you don't know. Every <laughs> <Yeah>. fucking <week. laughs> like, It's that like, there will always be a contingent with yeah. Frank Travieso from the South that is on winter summer form, you know, yeah. and will show up lit to the fucking nines ready to go, right? And it's like, yeah. so we knew it was gonna be very, very hard and overlapping. We knew that there's going to be a lot of crashes. And what we knew is you just basically had to ride the front the whole time until the race started to start to segment. And then the hard men just need to keep going harder. It's a very straightforward race, actually. Yeah. You know, Athens and Benchmark, Athens and Benchmark and Sunny King are very straightforward races. They seem very complex from the outside. Yeah. But from a physiological standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, they, they function a lot like a European spring classic. You know, yeah. like they're, they're very straightforward affairs over and over and over. And we were just saying you have to stay connected to the front splits. You know, like it, we found it to be because the weather was good. It was hot. The course was on a fast road. The, the course had been cleaned up a bit. We found it potential that you could lap that day. So we stayed attentive, but we just had to ride for position the whole day. And then we knew going into the last like, 20 or 30 minutes that a late move was very, very possible because of the attrition rates that day. So halfway through the race, halfway through the race, we said, okay, yeah, like, like this is still a thing where we should be racing full gas to the line. So, you know, about halfway through 45, 50 minutes in, you kind of, we have to make a choice whether we're going to shut down and race for the finish or whether we're going to keep racing wide open. And we made the call to keep racing wide open at the halfway point because we saw how fast and hard it was and how much the field was thinning. So we said, nope, let's keep doing it. And it was either going to be, my prediction was John, you know, like we, our top two guys that day were Connor and John Harris. And my prediction going in was John Harris because of that. I said, John Harris, well, because he races very aggressively and very attentively. And he had both, both Connor, Connor is one of the most flawless crit racers in America. He doesn't get any credit for that. Connor, Connor does not make mistakes. Like, if you want to, like, he's one of those guys. There's a handful of those guys, you know, like, yeah. like, like Dan. There's a few guys out there that just do not fuck up ever. And Connor Saley never fucks up. Zero yeah. times, you know what I mean? And John Harris, um, but John Harris has a special type of aggression where he's usually first to respond. So it makes him very likely to make late, late root moves on that. So, you know, I was talking to Frank Andrew before the race and I said, I said, Connor and John Harris will be in the top 10. My prediction is it's going to be a late move with John Harris in it. I'm sure as shit, right? And if yeah, you back yeah, up, right if you, but if you back up, it seems real obvious, right? Like if you yeah, back yeah. up, you know, if you look at it, you're like, most likely it's going to work out like that, you know? And so, like I said, you know, about 90% of the time, I can usually guess how a race is going to go only because I've seen so many. And I'm not like a super genius. It's like, if you watch a fuck ton of races or do a lot of races pretty soon, I mean, why is it Adam Myerson? you know, has won so many races or Tina pick or like yeah. Laura Van Gilder. Laura Van Gilder has like fucking, what is it? Literally like 400 pro wins. Oh yeah. It's, 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 it's insane, ridiculous. man. She's it's insane. insane, right? She's yeah. insane. And so, you know, and someone like Justin Williams could do that. Dave Richter has like 350. Kenny Williams had over 300 wins. I think Adam yeah. Myers, like if you look at these guys got, you know, like Steve Tilford, God rest his soul. Right. Yeah, but yeah. like, it's like, they start to, you start to just understand patterns and predictabilities and then the variables get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then, you know, even, you even start to be able to predict bad luck. So all that stuff starts to happen. And so 
because I kind of went like crazy at it. And then, and then, you know, because I kind of went crazy at it over the last, you know, 10 years of my life. And, and plus I raced in my twenties, you put all that together and you kind of develop, I, I'm not a genius or anything, but like, but I think these are learnable. If you study it, you can learn it. And then yeah. you understand. it's like saying, Oh, this doctor is a genius. Well, they might be, but they just went to med school. And so if you go to med school, you're going to learn stuff. And so I went to crit school and learned stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think that's super cool because it's like, you know, putting this out there, like John Harris, like before I asked that question, we all know if you don't know John Harris, like, I mean, he was professional for with yeah. CCB for quite some time. He raced in Europe. Um, yeah. Connor Sally was professional as well. So like yeah. some of these riders, they, they raced at a high level. So it's not like your team was like an underdog team, but they got burned and they got, yeah. and, and then they had to kind of start all over with a team yeah. and they're putting all this trust into you um, pretty much hoping that you wouldn't do the same thing to them. And, and, and I don't know their personal lives or like what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, if you watch American crit, which we'll put again down in the link below oh, yeah. or the description below, um, you can, you can see these guys actually they're broken in some way. And, and, and so we know that these riders are good enough to be at the front. So yeah. what, what would you say that butcher box has done for not only some of these guys that are at the top level, but at the younger level that, Probably would have yeah. never ever had a run if it wasn't for Butcher Box. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of well. I mean, there's a bit of yeah. It's crazy. It's I mean, I think one of the joys in life, right? I mean, who doesn't love these underdog stories, right? Yeah. It's like who doesn't root for that? I mean, you know, whether it's Justin Williams or or whoever. I mean, you know, at some point they started as the underdogs, you know, and and sure. I think I think those things are you know I think in many ways almost every athlete starts as an underdog, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like everything's pretty stacked against you and then you kind of grow from there. I think, I think I, I personally in my life have benefited a lot from, I found that the best people, the best people in a profession, whatever it is, are also the most generous, you know, like, yeah. like that's my definition. That's my definition of being good at something is yeah. that, is that you, you're skilled, you understand your skills and that you leverage your skills for more than just their base entry level results right like you're trying to yeah. maximize what it is i mean on a very fundamental level are you leaving the planet better than when you got to it <laughs> you know like, yeah, like yeah. this goes back to what we were saying before like did you are you asking these fundamental questions about your reasons and purpose and being in life you know like yeah. are you doing are, are you really fucking being mindful and, and analyzing your life and then understanding what you're trying to get out of it so I've been through that process. I've been fortunate enough to have mentors in my design career, my business career, and also my sports career, where people have really, it, like they bypass the performance question and get down to the fucking life question. It's like, I'm not very happy about my race. I walk into my coach's office in college and I'm like, I'm not really happy with my racing. And then I leave talking about like my future, <laughs> you know? And it's For like, because sure. if you don't have it lined, lined up on a fundamental level, you're not going to get the details right if you don't have the big picture right, you know? Yeah. So, so, so for, so, so for guys like, so for guys like John Harris and, and Connor Saley and Sam Rosenholtz and a lot of these guys, I had, I, you know, I had seen that happen in my professional career as a designer. I'd seen myself been through that process as an athlete, you know, yeah. suffering from a lot of injuries and a lack of, sometimes a lack of talent, to be honest, you know, and like hitting yeah. those limits. And so I was like, okay, there's more room for those guys to grow because they're at, they're trying to answer they're 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 asking the wrong questions right they're asking bike questions what they need to be asking is is like self questions right and the bike is just a way to solve to, to work those out you know so when we had the team when I looked at the team there was a, there is a necessity that I only had so much budget to start with right so you're looking for athletes that 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 aren't top, top, top commodities, right? It's a very classic mid-table football, money ball style approach to things, right? Sure. Where you're looking for athletes that you know have some talent um, and that they have availability, right? Yeah. And, and, and with that, you're willing to take on a whole bunch of stuff, either young kids that don't know very much or, or, or some more senior guys that come with problems, you know? Yeah. I'm not saying that Connor or John or anything was a problem, but they come with issues, right? Yeah. So, so with that also, those are all opportunities, right? That means you have a chance to take people and build a culture from ground zero. There's, there's a big, there's a big challenge when you can just buy off the table talent, right? Yeah, yeah. If I had, if I had six times my budget, I still don't know if I would just go and sign the names, 
Yeah. Like, I don't know. There's, there's problems with that. There's problems. Yeah. Like in my profession as a designer, I'm one of those guys and I'm a motherfucker. I charge a lot of money and I come with a lot of demands, but you'll get what I do. You know what I mean? So same thing in the sporting world. It's like, okay, let's say I could even afford a blank named talent. Do I want to, do I want that? They could be an angel. Or they could not be. They could think that they know how to do it. It's all this other stuff, right? Yeah. I knew if I knew, I knew with, if I could get guys that had talent and either didn't know or thought that, or thought or, or could have their minds changed, you can build them from the ground up. They're kind of all at zero, right? Like, yeah. like those guys were, those guys were rightfully so pretty fried and burnt out, but they still had a love for the sport and they still were young enough that they were like, I don't want to stop, but I don't know what to do to go forward. Or they're just getting into the level, a guy like Spencer, right? Who's just getting into the level and wants to go further that confluence is like they want to they want a new way that's the thing is they were ready for transformation and so the team functioned very much like a fucking like aa meeting <laughs> you know it was yeah. like it was like an intervention it was like sure. what like okay let's just do that and let's trust that and you know a guy like connor and and it's okay to talk about this publicly because uh, you know connor and i are good friends you know good friends now and, and call well colleagues you know colleagues and friends and we talk socially all the time and, and I, you know, I, I care for that. I care for him a lot. Right. But yeah. you know, he was really defensive early, you know, he was like very much like, I'm not sure. And I don't know. And he was, you know, and he wanted to try it. And now he's like, I, it's unbelievable how much he gives to the team, right? Like yeah. these guys give to the team. Right. And it, it, they just need to be, I think human beings just need to be shown that the whole world is not a vicious backstabbing fucking piece of shit cesspool. There's a, yeah. it's like, it is, it is. It is a fucking rat's den of fucking inequity and racism and misogyny and fucking hate and trash and fucking violence. It is that. For sure. But it is also generous and caring and all these other things. And I think I think it's I think there's very few examples. I think there's very few examples for young specifically for young men growing up where you can be sensitive and strong. You can be generous and tough. You can be a warrior and a poet. You can admire beauty and also fucking rage, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, and I think young men, young men are, are struggling to define a new level of masculinity for themselves and how to find their way forward and how to be more mindful and self-caring, but still be tough and aggressive and define that balance, right? No, and no. so I think, so I think part of, part of what I was viewing and is part of the philosophy where it started, we always wanted to have a men's and women's team for sure, always, because the sport's for everyone and it's fucking bullshit to not have a women's team right yeah you know and and the future is the future of the sport is going to be female and brown and and not even english you know what i mean like it's going to be something else it's not going to be a fucking white kid from the suburbs that's for sure yeah and the future is going to be something else so but i'm saying where it started was hey you know let's see if we can't set a, a different environmental a, a, a little different of an environmental example my primary job was as the first half of the season as a DS was just to show generosity, care, and accountability, yeah. you know? And it was like, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. I just want you to succeed. I'm not going to bark and yell and do anything at you. Even when you fuck up, that's not what you need, right? That's not what you need. You need generosity. And then I'm going to try to set an example of hard work, hustle, dedication, and detail, right? And like try to just be dialed and together and have my shit and never let my fatigue get the best of me, let, never let a bad day. And, and, you know, like to be in control of my own suffering and not let my suffering be in control of me, you know, yeah. and, and that I command my actions. And so by trying to set that example, to be caring for them, to, to, to do things like hug them. I don't know if these kids got hugged before, you know what I mean? And then, and then also at the exact same time, turn around, put us all in a huddle and say, Burn those fuckers to the goddamn fucking ground. Leave no man yeah, standing. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And to Double show ass. that, yeah, right. And to show that, that is, that, that's the warrior way. Like, like, you know, I've been very fortunate. I have combat pilots in my, in my family. I have, like, you know, like I have a confirmed ace as one of my uncles. You know, part of my client list includes, like, quite literally members of SEAL Team 6. Like, I've been very, very fortunate to be surrounded by true badass motherfuckers, right? Yeah. These are gentle giants. Yeah. Right? They, they have a depth of feeling. You, you, know, you know, if you think about it, if you think about, like, life is this, like this, if you think about life as the surface of water, right? And then 
the deeper, if you want to go way above the surface and you want to launch high, you have to pull something deep under the surface, right? Like a ball under the surface, right? And then it springs back up and goes higher to the other side. Well, our emotions and our, our life works the same way. If you want to be way, way up, you have to learn to come way, way down, right? Yeah. Samurais write poetry, right? Like, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like they, 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 like they take themselves way down so they can come way up. Well, also that spreads into life, right? If you want to be a true fucking savage monster, you can't really know savagery unless you truly know love and generosity, right? Like you have oh, to yeah, have, for sure. right? You have to have the full depth of emotion at your command. And that's what makes you an unbeatable motherfucker is that you can, you can wage love, you know, like, like you yeah. can, you, you battle, you can, you can turn to all these different emotional tools to defeat your foe and achieve your goals, right? You can, you can go to war for your brothers, or you can go to war for a cause, or you can go to war to defeat somebody. Those are all different tools that you can pull from. If you're just some fucking flexing bro, you, you got one note to play, you know? And so, so, so part of the team, so part of what that team was when it really started, and I think what captured a lot of people's imagination was that it was very much about like, it was very much in it about the environment of support and connectivity on each other, where it was like, let's talk, let's have real talks about real human beings, feelings, right? And it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to feel those ways. And because we're open and honest with each other, now we're ready to start talking about bike racing on a deeper level. And then strategy and tactics become a lot easier because now they're ready to become a functioning team and you could see in our first year the transformation that happened is now they started to be like okay no one's going to punch me in the face if i don't do well and no one's here to fuck me over and then you realize like it's all on me like all all those guys i turned a corner and was like okay it's about me and what i'm doing to commit and this team isn't a team unless i make it one right yeah it's not yeah, about sure. me it's not about me fucking at all <laughs> you know what i yeah. mean like it's a it's like it has fuck all to do with steve and and everything to do with everybody else and then then it really happened is we started to say okay we're let's be a team and let's let's go further and then all of a sudden the tactical discussion started happening we started racing at a much higher level and we were able to overcome real hardship when people were like hospitalized with injuries you know sure. like we were able to overcome that you know and then bounce back and and all that other stuff that that happened from it and then now we're we're taking on in 2020 we started to take on a women's program which was always the goal always the goal right yeah which comes with its own new set of socio-cultural issues right yeah you know where where you want to create an environment of positivity and support and accountability and 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 um judgment without villainizing people like you can say hey you did your job bad but you're not a bad person right yeah you did your you you did your job good but you're an asshole you know like yeah. like those yeah, are yeah. all vice versa, things, yeah. right? you know yeah, what i mean like sure. vice versa all those things right and where you know and so i think you know you know the guys the guys are on one trajectory and it's about bringing them up to higher and higher levels and now they're in a self-governing way our women's team you know has an outrageous fucking level of talent it's disgusting amounts of talent, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I was excited to see them race this year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a disgusting level of talent. And I think, I think there's a few, you know, they, they come with their own challenges and I think, you know, whatever good or bad habits they picked up from other programs, right. You, you have all that. That's a bit of the challenges. I have real, real winners on that team that come with their own ideas, which is good and bad. Right. Yeah. And then, and then on top of it, you have the, the burdens and challenges and opportunities currently, of being a professional female in which, you know, you're not allowed to just go out and race your bike. You're out there racing for femininity for Christ's sake. Yeah. Every time they get on a fucking bike, it's a goddamn political movement. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, no, like every, sure, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, so, yeah. It's wild. Cause like, I mean, you know, even thinking back on it, you know, I remember when butcher box started and started getting some of their early success. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the stuff you would hear was just like, why isn't there a women's team? And, you know, it's easy to think, like, why isn't there a women's team? Well, you know, if you guys don't know Steve, Steve's going to do something full gas, but he's going to make sure it's done right the first time, because the last thing he's going to want to do is bring all these women in here and be like, all right, I got a women's team, but that's the men's budget. So I can't pull from the men's budget to get you guys on bikes and you guys in clothes. So can you pay for your kit? Can you do this? Can you do that? Because right. then he's just supporting exactly what you guys that's don't want. Yeah, that's exactly it. it is extremely well said is, you know, our partnerships, 
our partnerships, you know, with our equipment manufacturers and our financial backers, especially Mike Salguero through Butcher Box, is you know obviously a huge proponent of healthy living and healthy eating, and that's at the core of our team's mission is yeah. promoting all natural athletics, right? Eat right, and I mean, you you and I share a very similar background in in I mean, you more so than me. I mean, w- you know where where you came from and how you transformed your life and, and body, and how. Yeah. You know, and, and the role of nutrition, real nutrition, not powders and gels and shit, but real eating and cooking transforms health and nothing's faster than healthy. And so that's at the core of the team. Health and wellness is at the core of our team. It should be at the core of every fucking team. But so sure. obviously emotional health and physical health through performance and then nutritional and wellness, all that comes together. So so we have a lot of backing on that, you know, from all of our, all of our partners from a performance standpoint, you can see how meticulously that they're curated from an ethical standpoint to start with. So it was a stepped out phase before we could add women and we did, we wanted to reward the men for helping grow the program. So we wanted to increase the budget for men. Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't get paid a goddamn fucking thing. In fact, this team costs me money out of my own pocket every year, yeah, yeah. regardless of what our budget is, if our budget, regardless of what our budget is. Right. So we wanted to take the guys that helped grow the program literally through blood, sweat, and tears, literal blood, sweat, and tears, and say, here's a better package for you this year to help you more, right? So more, more travel is covered, you know, more travel is covered, better equipment, better equipment structures, uh, better deals, and financially some extra perks and extra partnerships. Here's things we can do to support you better. Cool. Now, and then we can't offer you that until we can offer the exact same fucking thing for our women's program right yeah so we have 100 percent parity between the two of them right because life motherfuckers because that's what it is because there's no because like can we just get past gender some days can we just like can we just be done with gender and race at some one day man one day like one day our skin color like somebody won't be judging based off my name or skin color or whatever yeah i mean i it's insane to think about that like I can apply for a job and write down John and somebody could apply for a job and write down Juan and I might just get a call back just because my name's John. Right. You know right. what I mean? It's insane to freaking think about. It's still really real. And it's um so, you know, I think it's gonna be that way, you know, if we look at the course of American history, it takes some serious fucking shit to make progress, man. Oh, <laughs> you know? yeah, man. Like it it happens, you know, it's it's crazy. It's crazy, but I think sports, sports is where is is the place where I think it can happen. I think sports and science, sports yeah. and science are the two places it happens first, right? I yeah. think sports because you just can't deny the Jesse Owens factor, right? Like you just like you can just do it in Hitler's face, and there it is. You know what I mean? Like you know, and science where there just tends to be a lot more high mindedness. Now there's still a heavy level of misogyny in science. And we've seen that, but like you can just break through because sports and science both rely on results and data as yeah. a major determining factor. And if a person can just get the fucking job done, they get the job done. And that that's the entry point to acceptance culturally. Right. Sure. So sports and science has a huge responsibility. I think I take sports very fucking seriously for its sociopolitical impact super fucking seriously. So, so yes, our nutritional message is super fucking important because of that. I, I, the American food system is still fucking busted and it makes a big difference on what we say and what my athletes eat and do around other people makes a big fucking deal. And also this program to your point, John, was that I wanted to make sure once we had a women's program that it was treated with absolute equity the whole way. And that, awesome. and that equity wasn't a huge discussion, but it was a much more of a thing. Like, I, of course, yes, here I am on a public forums talking about equity and yeah. we're talking about this, but what, what you're more, what you're more likely hoping is the same thing that I'm going to assume someone like Justin Williams is hoping is that just like an athlete of color wins. And then sooner or later, it just becomes an athlete wins. And then sooner or later, it's just people win. Sure. Right. So sooner or later, it just becomes, I'm not the only program with the parity program, you know, out there. Right. You know, like, yeah. Steve Dino and I worked very, very hard to make sure that we could financially do that and do that the right way. Unfortunately, we're not getting much racing this year, but the commitment to 21 is we're already in those discussions. And so far, you know, 100% of our partners are not backing down from this commitment. Right. And they want to see this life where you see a full men's and women's program that's healthy and non-abusive and supportive and still demands performance, but supports the process to that. And like takes care of human beings because for every program, I just am I'm appalled by the stories that I hear about these fucking people. Like you look at these yeah. DSs and you're like, 
I'm not going to name any fucking names. There's no use in that. That doesn't help. You just win by setting a better example, right? You don't win For by sure. getting in the fight. You just set a better example and, you know, love drops hate. That's all you want. Sooner or later, people just side with yeah. love, you know? So yeah. what do you want to show is just like a team where, yeah, I mean, I don't mind being hard on my athletes sometimes. I'm very rarely am. I probably should be tougher on them. <laughs> but, but, you know, like what they hopefully see is, oh, there's a program where people are accountable, generous, and helpful to each other. Um, they also demand performance, compete very hard, um, and they set a higher standard for themselves, right? And if for that's sure. the atmosphere of the team, they set a high standard in how they treat each other, how they treat the environment, how they treat the community, how they take care of themselves. They're just working at a higher level is what they're trying to do. And it's not about even comparison, us versus another program. I'm just trying to get us to the highest level. And within that, we have, you know, we have gay, we have lesbian, we have Spanish speaking, we have English speaking, we have female, we have male. Okay, in my, like if I take the big fucking dirt nap and I'm out on a trail run and a fucking mountain lion comes and eats my face and that's my legacy is like, I at least set one fucking example in life where people just said that was a group of human beings trying to do their best. And they yeah, didn't say awesome. a bunch of, and they didn't say a bunch of women or a bunch of lesbians or a bunch of gays or a bunch of fucking straight white kids or whatever. They just said that's a group. Of, well, fuck, that's what we're trying to do, right? So. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the women come in with the same thing. Like, let me, let, John, let me be fucking absolutely clear on this. I, I, it didn't fucking dawn on me until I sat down at team camp to have like a talk for the race. And I sat down and it just fucking hit me. And I was like, holy shit, I look like the enemy. I was like, I'm a fucking 45 year old white male. Yeah. Yeah. And I was sure. like, I was like, hold, like, I didn't even, I was just sitting there and I was like, whoa, like I, did, I forgot. I forgot. I was like, yeah. I look like the douchebag that's been fucking causing this group of women their problems their whole fucking life, right? Yeah, dude. And I was like, I was like, okay, I, I need to like rethink a little bit on how I'm talking to them. Not that I was, I was trying to treat them exactly the same as the guys, you know. Yeah. I was like, but I was like, actually, no, I have to like shift a bit because like I am the face of fucking bad shit happening to women is yeah. like a 45 year old white male from business jesus fucking christ you know what I mean? like, yeah for like, sure i thought i had it bad when when i was dealing with uh the women from the levine law group like i you know being a part of that team i was just like oh my god like i i am the problem so I, what i did <laughs> is i was just like i'm just gonna give this to lauren leclerc who's fucking yeah. amazing by the way yeah and i was just oh like, she, she's a saint you make the decisions. You just let me know what happens just so I can make sure we can back it up. And then <laughs> like, she, she's a legend. So she takes care of everything. And I just pretty much have stepped back from that. And I don't even like saying I have any part in really in ownership. I just make sure that everything gets, I make sure the taxes get done. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. That's well, actually, let me, let me say this to you though. I think it's, I think your involvement, I think you're, it's important to show infrastructure i think it's important it's important and valuable for the athletes and the sport to know that there's infrastructure and backing and support there you know what i mean sure. that it's not so so i think it's it sets a message of confidence and professionalism that's good for your program and for others you know like for sure. like i talk a lot about you know i talk a lot about that I, I think everybody knows at this point but i'll take the time to say that it's not just me fucking running the team right you know yeah. it's not just you know, I think everybody knows our team. Well, at least inside the sport, people people know our team really well at this point. But you know, Steve and Dino, Steve Ramirez is our general manager, and he makes sure that like literally the Excel sheets fucking work properly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then uh, Dino Piscopanis is in charge of new business development and legal. Well, basically, legal financial is is his primary charter. We all talk about everything, but his primary charter. So he does that. He makes sure we don't get fucking sued or we don't fucking screw our riders over, or, you know, he handles visas, all that stuff. And, and also finances is that he makes sure that the business arrangements are structured properly. So it's doing it. And then I'm the performance director, which means both for the brand performance and for the team's performance. So I make sure that we're delivering the right content and the right messages and the right community engagement for our clients performance, all the things that what, yeah. how does a team perform? So our athletes from a, from a business standpoint, our athletes are just public entertainers, right? And so our primary, and you see this out of a lot of teams, which I champion and like, which is that they're just there to win the crowd, right? If you yeah. look at it, if you look at these models, like the results really isn't the thing for those teams. And I champion that. That's good. 
their job is to be out there in the community entertaining people. And it's more important basically if they win the party than they win the bike race, right? Yeah. And that's cool. Like that's great for their sponsors. And that's a good thing. I'm not denying that. That's great. Because we have a nutrition, wellness, health message, showing that translate into results is a viable tactic. It'd be weird to say yeah, yeah. eat better and finish mid pack. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, it's sure. like, yeah, you yeah. know, it's, it's a tough message to get to tell people, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so if, if you want to finish mid pack, eat butcher box. I know, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a a little tough, it's a little tough to be like, you should eat all natural proteins so you can get your ass kicked. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's a little tough to argue. So, yeah. so we don't sell results. I mean, our, all, of our, all of our partners would be just as happy as long as we're near the front of the race. It just so happens that we win 20 something races a year. Just so happens because we like to compete hard and that's part of our message. And I love it. I love fucking competing hard. So, yeah, yeah. so, but the relation, so if you look at that relationship between, you know, it's, and we also this year also have uh, Elizabeth Everhart is our uh, account manager and she runs a lot of our day to day. Tanya, Bol uh, Tanya Bolanova runs our uh, public, she's our publishing manager. Although I do directly a lot of my social, I turn over a lot of that to Tanya and Beth to handle the day-to-day -day media relations, interviews, all that stuff. And then Kristen Arnold, who also races with us, is our nutrition manager. And so she's helping work on our cookbook. She does our nutritional seminars, all that stuff. So awesome. it's kind of a surprisingly large network that I think people know about, but I think that's reassuring. It makes it seem like we have a $5 million a year budget. We do not but we're built like that type of a thing so we can grow into it, right? Yeah. So same thing as in regards, I think it's important that teams, the teams with infrastructure, I think teams that want to stick around will think in relationship terms, not in financial terms. They'll think in yeah. what relationships am I building, right? Then they're gonna think in terms of what deliverables, what am I doing for the people that give me money? If the answer is win a bike race, you're not gonna be around very long. You know, so, so what is, what is the team doing for what, what relationships, what is the team doing to boost and benefit those relationships? What is it a conduit for? And then is it thinking in terms of infrastructure, even if it's just written on paper, like, is there a manager? Yeah. Is there a, this, is there is that it can, even if you're only 10 people, like you're a 10 person cyclocross team, just like treat it like a big company at like for a second. Right. And then it could still be a bunch of bros and babes fucking in t-shirts and denim shorts racing single speed. That's great. But like even, even a fucking like a, even like a chess club has like a keeper of minutes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, if you set up the infrastructure, it allows you to take charge of opportunities and gives you a way to react to problems. It allows you to be around for a while. So we, I always, you know, I come from an entrepreneurial background. I, run and own multiple companies and so i built it like a like i would a hundred million dollar business from day one right and then got partners and signed them on now it was always you know it's small and grows from pieces from there but it's got the skeleton that if if i if i quadrupled my budget this off season which is what 2020 is <laughs> if yeah. i quadruple my off my budget i would know you know steven dino and elizabeth and myself would all know exactly what to do with it We'd be awesome. like, okay, we'll do this, we'll bring this on, we'll add this, we'll do this, and we'll do that, and we'll take care of this and move it here. We want to add in gravel, we want to add in adventure racing, we want to start getting into motorsports, you know. So, like, as long as it's racing, right? If it yeah. involves a race, so you know, Faster Days runs Faster Days owns this the, is the is the ownership that runs these teams. As long as it involves going fucking fast, we're into it. So downhill skiing, fucking rally cross, uh, motorcycles, gravel anything that's fast right so we started with bikes because we fucking love bike racing because it's so fucking cool but i want to get into other two-wheeled shit as soon as fucking possible right and so yeah. it just takes time so so you know anyways that's that's that that's that invisible side to it that i think is really important to make sure you can stick around year after year so you're not starting from scratch every fucking year right no yeah and i, I think that's perfect man we're kind of coming up on a on yeah, yeah, yeah wrapping it up but uh but yeah dude that's that's amazing so you guys you've You've literally heard from inception all the way to business model to creation, <laughs> everything all in one. Uh, I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks so much for your time. And I yeah. uh, would love to have you back on, especially when racing gets started back up. Man. Yeah, it was super fun. I really like your project. And uh, I think you getting it. I think this van project, everybody should be listening to it. Um, oh, thanks, man. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of podcasts out there that are a bunch of journalists talking about sports, and it's amazing to have someone like you that really understands the sport at the absolute highest level, 
um, as a competitor going out there and, and, uh, and, and bringing the, the real stories of the sport to life. I'm a huge supporter of what you're doing and any way I can help out in the future, definitely. Thanks, man. Well, hopefully when COVID is lifted, we can actually do it in the van. It could be Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm ready for it as creepy as that's going to be. I'm ready. That's going to be great. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. Peace. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon, John.